Good afternoon, all. Um, welcome back to the Spinal Cord Injury Lecture Series. We're uh, going to pick up where I left off last time um, and uh, spend uh, our time today talking specifically about the comorbidities associated with spinal cord injury. Um, give me a thumbs up if you can hear me, just so that I know that um, I'm, thank you. I appreciate it. Um, so I'm going to talk through the uh, pathophysiology in a little bit more detail today. Uh, we're going to talk about the influence of both the somatic and the autonomic uh, dysfunction associated with the spinal cord injury. And this hopefully will provide the foundation for uh, upcoming lectures as we continue on through there. So you've seen this list before. Um, it seems like it gets a little bit more extensive uh, to me every time I go through it, but um, we're gonna spend some time going through each of these issues and how that is going to um, change the way that we look at our, our folks with spinal cord injury and the medical care that they're, they're gonna require as they go through there. One of the first things um, as we go by organ system is the pulmonary function. Uh, or the pulmonary dysfunction associated with spinal cord injury. Um, we know, for example, that uh, because of the respiratory uh, paralysis, they're gonna have a reduced forced vital capacity and tidal volume. Um, and this is gonna result in atelectasis, that is the alveoli, particularly at the bases of the lung, won't uh, completely expand. Um, if that occurs, um, and so for example, if any of us aren't taking deep breaths, uh, Consistently, the alveoli um, are it, actually the work of breathing is going to become harder because without expansion of the alveoli, we see a reduction in surfactant production. And remember that surfactant helps to re, uh, reduce the uh, tension, uh, the surface tension. Um, and so ultimately, the work of breathing is going to be increased. So part of this is just related to the um, uh, mechanics of a somatic paralysis. But we also have the parasympathetic dominance uh, following a spinal cord injury, particularly higher levels uh, that uh, influence the sympathetic nervous system. So that we end up with a relative bronchial or constriction and significant mucus secretions. Um, our folks are also gonna be at a little bit higher risk for aspiration, uh, particularly those with cervical injuries and surgical fu uh, fusion. Um, and we know that the level of spinal cord injury actually uh, predicts the number of respiratory complications. So muscles of respiration, inspiration, um, basically all of us uh, can appreciate taking a deep breath. For folks who are not able to meet their respiratory needs through the usual um, muscles of inspiration, that is the diaphragm and the internal intercostal muscles, you'll start to see them utilize sternocleidomastoid, the trapezius and scalene muscles. As you see those muscles come into play to uh, facilitate uh, breathing, uh, recognize that that person is uh, minutes away from uh, going into a respiratory crisis. Um, that said, uh, expiration is typically a passive process for most of us. Uh, and involves relaxation of the rectus abdominis, transverse abdominis, and internal and external obliques. Um, in order to generate a cough to clear secretions, you have to activate those muscles. Um, and so uh, if you are unable to do that, then uh, mucus secretions and other things that are sitting within the uh, bronchial tree won't be able to be cleared effectively unless we use uh, different methods. So just a reminder that uh, under normal circumstances, our abdominal muscles uh, hold the abdominal contents in and up against the diaphragm uh, so that when you go to contract the diaphragm, uh, you have a pretty good tidal volume uh, as, as you do that. Um, if, the if the muscles uh, are paralyzed, however, the abdominal muscles uh, basically are gonna allow the abdominal contents to slip down and out the resting length of the diaphragm is going to significantly change so that now when you go to contract, you're going to have a relatively small tidal volume involved. And we can restore that by using a, uh, an amazing technological advance called an abdominal binder. Uh, we put the abdominal binder on, it pulls the abdominal contents in and up uh, and restores the resting length of the diaphragm so that again, we can get a full tidal volume as we go through there. 
So uh, because of the somatic disruption associated with spinal cord injury, higher levels uh, are going to have less and less ability to uh, both inhale as well as exhale. Um, and so we're gonna call this a neurogenic restrictive lung disease. Uh, these folks are gonna have a lower vital capacity, a reduced total lung capacity and very shallow breathing unless uh, accommodated with an abdominal binder. Uh, in response to shallow breathing, they're gonna have tachypnea, that is rapid breathing. Um, and we recognize that the pulmonary compliance is, is going to significantly reduce, that is the elastic work of breathing is gonna increase. And other examples of restrictive lung disease include scoliosis, obesity, obstructive apnea, um, muscular dystrophies, and ALS. Um, so as a reminder, uh, the autonomic nervous system uh, is uh, going to be affected after a spinal cord injury, particularly a high spinal cord injury. And we will have a relative um, dominance of the parasympathetic nervous system over the sympathetic nervous system, which will be blunted after this. Um, and so in response, we will also have a neurogenic obstructive lung disease um, because the parasympathetic influence is relatively unopposed uh, by sympathetic nervous system. And so we're gonna end up with bronchiolar constriction, mucus secretions, and this unopposed obstructive lung disease um, as we work through there. So you all know this, uh, hopefully we've been through this several times now, but um, I'm uh, pretty much a stickler about respiratory management after spinal cord injury, particularly high spinal cord injury, um, which are going to require a combination of typically bronchodilators, uh, nebulizer treatment to uh, loosen um, and uh, thin secretions, uh, and then subsequent clearance of those secretions. Um, and that will involve a number of different things as we go through there. So we recognize that um, there's a 67% uh, likelihood of respiratory complications, particularly in the acute setting. Part of this is because of the atelectasis uh, that occurs and subsequently pneumonia and respiratory failure. Um, we're gonna talk through in an upcoming lecture, the uh, vent management strategies uh, that are required, um, taking into account both the neurogenic restrictive as well as the neurogenic obstructive lung disease. And recognize that many of our pulmonary colleagues uh, who've not worked with spinal cord injury are not gonna be comfortable with these settings, particularly the tidal volumes and peeps uh, for spinal cord injury, it's gonna be important that you all know how to describe uh, why these are necessary. And so we'll, we'll get to that in more detail in an upcoming lecture, a couple of weeks. Um, we realize that using a, a cough assist is one name, but the major name for this is mechanical insufflation, exsufflation, uh, and that is, uh, a device that provides assisted deep breathing. Um, and basically uh, they will typically use this uh, over the mouth, even when the person has a uh, trach in place. Um, and the key thing here is to help clear secretions that otherwise wouldn't be cleared. Now, as you put all these together, the timing is gonna be uh, very important. Uh, the nebulizer treatment um, using uh, ideally duo nebs, so both albuterol as well as atrovent. Um, that uh, management strategy is gonna be helpful only to the extent that you can also clear the secretions. And so immediately following nebulizer treatment, you wanna provide postural percussion and drainage or significant vibration of the chest wall to break loose secretions from the airways and then follow that immediately by the mechanical inexsufflation so that you can clear these um, uh, secretions from the airways. Otherwise, they will just dry up and cause a mucus plug uh, and your folks are gonna end up back in the ICU requiring bronchoscopy, uh, which can be prevented if we are utilizing these three things, nebulizer treatment, posture percussion and drainage and mechanical inexsufflation appropriately. So we've talked about the, uh, to some extent, the influence on the cardiovascular system. You recognize that the uh, sympathetic chain, the sympathetic nervous system arises from the thoracolumbar regions of the cord and blunting of that is gonna significantly uh, influence not just respiratory, but also cardiovascular uh, physiology. So a circulatory hypokinesis occurs 
Um, this is uh, a, a drop in blood pressure um, during increasing uh, resistance uh, or increasing workloads uh, from the upper extremity because of reduced vasoconstriction, reduced venoconstriction, the sympathetic uh, blunting is going to contribute to both of those. And then you have an impaired venous pump um, as well. So without the muscle pump, without the deep inspirations that also helps to uh, uh, create a vacuum essentially to the vascular tree, um, you're gonna end up having this uh, situation we call circulatory hypokinesis. So a person who's exercising with their upper extremities um, recognize that they'll still have blood flow within the upper extremities, but you're gonna have a relative stasis um, in the lower extremities. And these folks, um, unless we compensate somehow by say wrapping the lower extremities by providing an abdominal binder, uh, they're gonna be very, very limited in terms of their exercise responses. Um, we also see uh, in, related to that uh, an impaired cardiac output. Um, recognize that the stroke volume is going to be diminished because of an adaptive myocardial atrophy. So you have a diminished afterload that you're pushing against uh, with a lower blood pressure. You have a diminished preload because you've got relative stasis in the lower extremities in the inferior vena cava. That's going to reduce your left ventricular end diastolic volume. So by Starling's mechanism, you're going to have less contractility. Your stroke volume is going to be diminished. Um, and you're going to have a blunted chronotropic response because of a blunted sympathetic uh, influence on the sinoatrial node. And so it's rare that we see uh, heart rates over 120 beats per minute, even on maximal exertion for our folks with spinal cord injury above T3. Early on, it's also likely that we will see um, heart block and dysrhythmias uh, because of the profound sympathetic blunting uh, following the acute spinal cord injury. So as we bring folks over to the rehab center, um, our first goals uh, within the first week or so are just to be able to get them to sit up without passing out uh, because they're gonna end up having um, a neurogenic hypotension. And in, in the ER, they may also have a hypovolemic shock type of the syndrome um, where their blood pressure drops. But in response, you would expect to see a compensatory tachycardia. When you have sympathetic blunting because of the spinal cord injury, you can't mount that compensatory uh, tachycardia. And in fact, you see um, hypotension in the face of bradycardia. And so it's gonna be very important in the um, emergency setting, acute setting, uh, and in the ICU that we're managing uh, fluids judiciously. There may have been some volemia, uh, hypovolemia associated with their injury, but um, we have to help folks in the ICU also understand the influence of the blunted sympathetic nervous system on this. So we're gonna, um, as we bring those folks over, uh, consider using tilt table uh, recline wheelchair to allow them to participate fully in their therapies. Um, they're gonna use an abdominal uh, binder uh, to try to compress organs against the inferior vena cava and increase the amount of blood return uh, back to the heart. Uh, we're going to provide elastic stockings. TED hose are not sufficient and make sure that we provide adequate hydration. And then we'll use uh, salt tablets, typically fluorinep and metadrin um, as necessary to get their blood pressure up where they don't pass out in the early phases of rehabilitation. Our folks are also gonna be at high, high risk for venothromboembolus, VTE. Um, and uh, in addition to the relative uh, hemostasis that we see in the lower extremities and in the inferior vena cava, um, immediately following the spinal cord injury and within the first four to six weeks, there is actually a hypercoagulability associated with this where the clotting cascade actually changes. And so we'll talk through that a little bit um, in upcoming lectures. Uh, so we're going to provide uh, prophylaxis, um, ideally in the form of uh, low molecular weight heparin, continued for 8 to 12 weeks, depending upon the severity of the injury and uh, the concomitant uh, injuries associated with this. Um, we'll talk through the uh, use of heparin, Coumadin, and an IVC filter, um, but none of these are ideal management strategies for the person with acute spinal cord injury. 
Autonomic dysreflexia is something all of you need to know about um, and know well enough to be able to describe to somebody with a new spinal cord injury as well as to our clinical colleagues uh, who often have not heard of autonomic dysreflexia. First described by Anthony Bowlby back in 1890, uh, this is a massive sympathetic outflow in response to a noxious stimuli below the level of the injury, um, resulting in hypertensive crisis and potentially stroke, seizures, organ failure, and death. Um, the most likely culprit of autonomic dysreflexia is a distended bladder uh, and or a urinary tract infection. Sensory signals uh, ascend the cord, but they are blocked at the level of the spinal cord injury. And we get a relative sympathetic uh, reflex that causes splanchnic vasoconstriction and hypertension. Increased pressure is sensed by baroreceptors that send information to the medulla, which sends information back to the heart to cause a relative bradycardia. And, um, and yet below the level of the injury, the person remains vasoconstricted. Above the level of the injury, however, uh, they are vasodilating, flushing, sweating, and they get this pounding headache associated with autonomic dysreflexia. So we'll talk through the acute management, uh, but uh, just as a quick reminder, first thing we're gonna do is elevate the head to try to help reduce the blood pressure, loosen any tight clothing, leg bags, et cetera, that could be um, perceived as a noxious stimuli below the level of the injury. Check in order, bladder, bowel, and then other sources and consider pharmacological intervention, including emergent treatment uh, with nit nitropaste, uh, typically. And again, we'll talk through quick set uh, orders on these. If you have a situation in which the person has a, uh, a chronic noxious stimuli, so they have a fracture, uh, for example, or they have a new pressure injury, uh, to you or I, we would perceive that as being painful for them, uh, they just get autonomic dysreflexia, stroke at and die, which is suboptimal. Um, so we're going to um, talk through uh, treatment strategies uh, for autonomic dysreflexia, including um, the uh, longer term management uh, uh, using medications like dibenzaline, prazosin, in some cases clonidine to be able to keep their blood pressures under control. Uh, despite these scenarios. So we mentioned neurogenic bladder as being the primary cause. We're gonna be talking through upper motor neuron management as well as lower motor neuron management. Um, actually, it was uh, bladder management uh, that was one of the major causes of death in our folks with spinal cord injury. Uh, for those who lived uh, more than a couple of months uh, prior to the 1970s, Oftentimes they would die because of acute renal failure associated with, um, unfortunately, not knowing how to manage uh, the bladder uh, appropriately. We're going to talk through renal dysfunction and urinary tract infections, a little bit of calculus, um, no trigonometry, no algebra. We'll, we'll stick to the basics of uh, calculi and then bladder management um, as we go through. Neurogenic bowel um, is going to be uh, fairly similar in terms of the likelihood of causing um, unfortunate uh, accidents uh, for our folks with spinal cord injury. So um, a uh, bowel incontinence uh, is a situation that none of us uh, would feel comfortable with, uh, certainly in, in a psychosocial setting. Uh, this is something that we need to help our folks uh, gain control of as soon as possible. Again, we'll talk through the use of upper motor neuron uh, facilitation of reflexes uh, in managing those types of injuries, um, recognizing that a lower motor neuron, an injury to the cauda equina is going to be managed much differently. Um, and so with the upper motor neuron uh, bowels, we can uh, use those reflexes to facilitate evacuation. Um, and recognizing that we're gonna to have to use different strategies for folks with lower motor neuron injuries. Sexuality, so the top three concerns for folks with spinal cord injury include bladder management, bowel management, and sexuality. Um, and that's for folks with both uh, paraplegia as well as tetraplegia. So we will talk through the uh, aspects of sexuality and fertility uh, for both men and women, uh, recognizing that these uh, have a huge influence on uh, psychosocial feelings of uh, fitting into society. And so we'll talk through these 
in more detail as we go through here. Pressure injuries are something we want to prevent as much as possible. Uh, you and I typically won't get pressure injuries. Why? Because we have uh, painful reminders that our skin is becoming ischemic um, and or the underlying tissue. And so we shift frequently um, during the course of the day, whether we're sitting um, and or lying down. Um, recognize that if we didn't have those signals subconsciously coming to us, we wouldn't know to uh, prevent uh, the ischemia associated with them. And we would subsequently also develop pressure injuries. Um, so we're gonna talk through the uh, issues of pressure points, classifying pressure injuries, and then talk about management. Obviously focusing on prophylaxis as much as possible, but also discussing medical and uh, surgical interventions uh, that are gonna be necessary as we go through here. Recognize that uh, spasticity is hyperreflexia uh, gone awry. Um, and uh, the actual definition for spasticity is uh, velocity dependent tone. So the faster you move a limb through its range of motion, um, the more vigorous uh, response that you're gonna get in uh, essentially the reflex uh, that comes through that. So uh, we're gonna talk about disruption of upper motor neuron um, pathways and the influence that has on the final common pathway, uh, which is our reflex pathways. It includes the muscle spindles coming back to the cord and subsequently outflow of the alpha motor neuron causing uh, contraction um, of the agonist muscle group. Um, so uh, we will talk through this whole disinhibition of the reflex arc, uh, the pathways. We're gonna talk through different classifications um, so that when we talk about spasticity management, we're talking about the same thing. We'll talk about uh, the Ashworth uh, score, the modified Ashworth score, and then the pen spasm scale as well. Um, and this also has profound influence on the person's um, ability to uh, uh, get around in the community, uh, ability to get a good night's sleep, uh, et cetera. So we'll talk through several management strategies. Um, and as we go through these strategies, recognize that there will be uh, side effects associated with each of the interventions. Um, and so ultimately we're looking for a way to balance um, management uh, in a way that uh, will minimize the side effects that the person is gonna to have to deal with. So there are additional uh, spinal cord injury health risks that we've talked through. Um, obesity and metabolic syndrome is a huge issue associated with diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, and coronary artery disease. Um, we don't see uh, the kind of profound metabolic syndrome that we see in spinal cord injury in able-bodied populations. Why is that? Because they just don't accumulate the same relative amount of adipose tissue that we see in spinal cord injury. You have such a profound loss of um, muscle and bone metabolically active tissue uh, that even trying to reduce energy intake by half of what would usually uh, uh, be provided, um, our folks will continue to gain fat weight and more and more fat tissue ultimately leads to the metabolic syndrome. So we'll talk through that. Um, our folks are gonna be higher risk for stroke. Um, we're gonna talk through upper extremity degenerative joint disease, osteopenia and depression, all of which are associated with uh, spinal cord injury risk. Um, the neurogenic obesity that we uh, reported way back in 2007, uh, we've gained a lot more information in recent years. And in fact, next month, there will be a new issue in uh, the topics in spinal cord injury rehabilitation out that will discuss neurogenic obesity as we know it now, uh, including bo body composition changes, including um, uh, aspects of uh, you know, the diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia that we talk about all the time, but as well, um, the upper extremity overuse associated with neurogenic obesity, the neuropathic pain associated with it, the obstructive sleep apnea. And we're gonna talk through uh, in this new um, issue uh, basically energy expenditure. We'll talk through uh, dietary 
uh, management strategies, as well as uh, energy expenditure and exercise strategies. So um, we anticipate uh, this is gonna have a huge influence on the field. Um, and so be looking for that uh, next month, actually, as it comes out. And the Lynn Rehab Center is actually gonna be sponsoring this particular issue um, as it comes through. Exercise um, is uh, significantly hampered after a spinal cord injury. Uh, part of that is because of the impaired diaphragmatic excursion. Uh, and so using an abdominal binder to facilitate exercise uh, for those folks with um, injuries, uh, basically um, above the level of T10 or so um, is gonna have a huge uh, uh, limiting effect on a person's ability to, uh, to exercise. Um, as well as the impaired sympathetic drive and the hypothalamic medullary responses. Uh, all of this associated with uh, dysfunctional exercise after spinal cord injury. Recognize that when you thermal regulate in Miami, uh, when you're going out and exercising, uh, one of the best ways that you can thermal regulate is to sweat. Um, not that anybody sweats in Miami, but for those who do, you are dissipating heat, uh, which allows you to continue to exercise. For folks with spinal cord injury, they're gonna be partially poikilothermic. That is, they will not sweat below the level of the injury. And so heat dissipation is gonna be significantly um, impaired uh, following a spinal cord injury, uh, so that they're gonna have significant problems managing heat and the heat loads uh, that we see associated, particularly with hot and humid climates. So. We'll spend a little bit of time talking through uh, some of those issues as well. Um, and then there are a number of endocrine responses after spinal cord injury that are gonna be different uh, than we would typically see in the able-bodied population. So we'll talk through the relative increase in catabolic hormones, um, particularly uh, corticosteroids uh, and glucagon. And I say relative because uh, the anabolic hormone dysfunction is significantly greater than the catabolic hormone dysfunction. And so we also see a reduction in growth hormones, somatomedins, um, and uh, testosterone, particularly in men. Uh, but similarly, we see uh, hormonal changes in women as well uh, that will influence their ability to uh, burn calories. And so we're going to have problems with them uh, as well as uh, we look at this. We talk about osteopenia, osteoporosis. Um, I think there's been a recent uh, uh, faculty presentation on this. I think Dr. Shapiro recently talked about uh, osteopenia, osteoporosis. Um, but when we look at spinal cord injury, we recognize that there are significantly more influences than would be seen in simply um, an elderly woman uh, who is developing osteopenia, osteoporosis. Part of this is because of the mechanical unloading, um, which essentially is gonna to lead to a mobilization of hypercalcemia, but as well after a spinal cord injury, testosterone, estrogen, and growth hormone levels are typically diminished. Um, we see changes in parathyroid hormone and calcitonin as well. And then there are um, neuronal changes uh, that contribute to bone loss. Um, and uh, significantly increasing osteoplastic activity, uh, which basically breaks uh, bone down further. Um, and then finally, the obesity-related cytokines. So IL-1, IL-6, tumor necrosis factor, all, all of those will stimulate osteoclastic activity after spinal cord injury. And so you have uh, four different mechanisms by which you're gonna see uh, osteoporosis following spinal cord injury. Uh, this will be seen uh, to a greater extent in the lower extremities than the upper extremities that may be being able to provide at least some function, some mechanical loading to the upper extremities. Immobilization hypercalcemia, for those of you who are managing spinal cord injury patients right now, you recognize um, these folks are, are uh, likely to develop um, hypercalcemia uh, with the clinical signs and symptoms associated with uh, including stones, bones, groans, and moans. Um, and uh, so this is uh, especially um, profound in uh, young men who have developed a significant bone mass uh, in their late teens and early 20s. Um, as they stop using those bones acutely, 
uh, they are going to be dumping a significant amount of calcium from the bones into the bloodstream. Um, and we're going to be having to manage this. Uh, typically, you're going to create diuresis and flushing out uh, by providing um, IV fluids. And so it's a matter of trying to cycle all of that calcium out uh, through the kidneys uh, in the early stages until they develop a relative um, uh, homeostasis. It's gonna be new and different than it was prior to their spinal cord injury. So um, again, all of these things are gonna be uh, noticeable in young men, but we see them as well in young women and then uh, older individuals, typically not to the same extent because they don't have the same amount of uh, bone calcium uh, that we see in our young folks. <laughs> That was just to wake you up uh, to make sure that you're still paying attention. We may develop heterotopic ossification as well. And this is uh, gonna be a combination of things. Uh, typically, heterotopic ossification occurs in spinal cord injury um, in the hips, knees, shoulders, and elbows. Um, and so uh, a lot of times as we see uh, folks emerging out of spinal shock uh, within the first four to eight weeks typically after their spinal cord injury, they are going to start to have more spasticity, uh, significant tone around the hips and knees uh, to a greater extent. Um, and that increased tone apparently helps to drive the uh, mesenchymal stem cells into the joints themselves uh, where they start laying down uh, new bone. Um, and so uh, we'll talk through management strategies for heterotopic ossification uh, as well. Overuse syndromes uh, are likely to occur uh, in any of us who subsequently have to use upper extremities for um, mobility. And so um, if you were to injure uh, a leg, say knee or ankle, you might be able to get around pretty well still using crutches, but in doing so, you would be overloading your upper extremities to a greater extent. And while you may not have had problems with your shoulders, elbows, wrists, or hands prior to that, if you stayed on crutches for a significant amount of time, uh, you would uh, ultimately be at high risk for developing musculoskeletal disorders. Those who are uh, with spinal cord injury who need to use wheelchairs and, and particularly manual wheelchairs for mobility, um, we promote that as much as we can, knowing that that's going to increase their energy expenditure and hopefully help to reduce their likelihood of obesity. However, um, again, propelling a manual wheelchair. So uh, just to see if anybody's listening, how many steps uh, are each of you encouraged to take daily uh, in order to maintain appropriate physical fitness? 10,000 approximately 10,000 steps a day. Um, now, because you get a little bit of a spin with your wheelchair propulsion, um, we might not see 10,000 hits a day on the hand rims, but it is likely that we'll see somewhere between six and 8,000 hits a day on a manual wheelchair for somebody who is maintaining relatively uh, increased physical activity. Um, that in and of itself is gonna put them at high risk for developing carpal tunnel syndrome. Um, but as well, uh, wrist uh, osteoarthritis, elbow uh, overuse, shoulder overuse, um, including um, uh, de Quervin's tenosynovitis, uh, epicondylitis, and rotator cuff impingement. Uh, so as that occurs, our folks are going to become less active with wheelchair propulsion. They are going to be um, at higher risk for having uh, inappropriate pressure relief in their manual wheelchair and likely to develop pressure injuries. Um, and so we're gonna talk through management of overuse uh, syndromes. We'll talk through prophylaxis as well. Um, and particularly what are uh, appropriate um, activities to avoid and um, uh, significant strengthening activities that should be incorporated in their, uh, their daily management uh, strategies. Pain. Um, for any of us is, is problematic. Um, and so uh, those of us who experience no susceptive pain because of, uh, so let's say overactivity, let's say a sprain or a strain, 
Um, temporarily, uh, we can manage those typically with NSAIDs. The nociceptive pain is uh, pretty responsive to uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, relative rest, ice, compression, elevation, uh, those types of things. Um, no susceptive pain below the level of the injury for somebody with a spinal cord injury, however, um, isn't perceived as pain, but instead autonomic dysreflexia. And so if they are having um, significant no susceptive input, they're gonna be at high risk for um, autonomic dysreflexia and increased spasticity. Uh, below the level of the injury because of this uh, nociceptive afferent uh, influence. Um, neuropathic pain um, can occur in the upper extremities. Uh, we talked about uh, carpal tunnel. Ulnar neuropathies can also cause uh, neuropathic pain. Um, but uh, when it occurs at the level of a spinal cord injury, it's very, very difficult to manage. And yet we need to do what we can to help manage that as best we can. There's uh, evidence that, that needs a uh, significant science to uh, develop it further, but uh, some evidence that also shows increasing adiposity increases neuropathic pain. Um, and so neuropathic pain at or below the level of the injury is also going to be problematic. Um, folks with spinal cord injury can still develop complex regional pain syndrome that is experienced just as autonomic dysreflexia or increased spasticity. Um, and so it's very important for us to find underlying cause of pain. And we're gonna talk through those in subsequent lectures. Um, there can be neurological change after a spinal cord injury. So typically we think of spinal cord injury as being static uh, injury. And so somatic dysfunction typically uh, shouldn't change um, nor should uh, autonomic function after a spinal cord injury. However, uh, there can be a number of things that contribute to um, an ascending uh, loss of function. So uh, syrinx is one of the things that we worry about most likely. Remember that uh, oftentimes after a spinal cord injury, uh, folks will develop this cavity within the cord itself. Um, that cavity is also subject uh, to um, increases in blood pressure, which are subsequently conducted to their cerebral spinal fluid. And so uh, folks who have generally increased high blood pressure are also gonna be at higher risk for developing increased cerebral spinal fluid pressure, uh, which can cause an ascension of a syrinx um, and subsequent loss of function, both sensory function as well as motor function uh, below that ascending uh, injury, um, if you will. Folks can also develop hematoma. And so for those folks who, for example, had been on uh, DVT uh, management uh, or PE management, and so we're on um, apixaban or Coumadin, for example, and then um, developed a urinary tract infection, somebody just put them on, you know, reflexively a, um, an antibiotic that could change uh, the INR. So for example, so, uh, they had been stable with an INR of say between two and three. Um, you put them on an antibiotic like Bactrim uh, for their urinary tract infection and suddenly their INR can jump to 10 or above, which puts them at high, high risk for bleeds. Um, and um, I had a patient that this occurred in once while on the acute services uh, she had a thoracic spinal cord injury at T7. She subsequently was put on antibiotic. Her INR increased. She developed a hematoma in the cord at the cervical level. And so instead of having a T7 spinal cord injury, she subsequently had a T5 injury because of the bleed. Um, so again, these are things that can be preventable, uh, but we need to be aware of them as we're going through. New trauma can occur uh, for somebody with a spinal cord injury. Uh, those folks who are at risk for falling out of their chairs, uh, for example, um, or, and who would have thunk, but um, I've seen uh, a patient with worst case scenario, an old spinal cord injury, a new case of um, multiple sclerosis, and then they developed a tumor on top of that. Uh, so that was a case study, uh, obviously, but all of these things uh, can change a person's functional mobility and ability to perform independent activities of daily living. So 
we will talk through those. And then there's a lot of discussion ongoing about um, optimizing motor recovery after spinal cord injury. Um, there is an awful lot we don't know yet uh, about uh, motor recovery. Um, there's a lot of uh, really uh, cutting edge research being done looking at spinal cord stimulators uh, to facilitate motor recovery um, in combination with um, all types of other rehabilitation strategies, in some cases, uh, stem cell strategies, et cetera. So all of these things um, we are continuing to look at uh, after spinal cord injury. There is significant pathophysiology, but there's also uh, an opportunity to look at um, return of function, uh, motor recovery, sensory recovery, and subsequently functional uh, mobility after a spinal cord injury. So there was one, oh, Katie Gant, thanks, 10,000, yes. Um, Eddie beat you to it, or maybe not. I don't know if that came in before. Um, this uh, it wraps up my lecture for today. Um, this is to set the foundation for upcoming lectures. Uh, we are going to spend significant time looking at the international standards for the neurological classification of spinal cord injury. Um, these are updated uh, intermittently. The last update came in 2019, and we're gonna talk about why it's so important to get this right, particularly for the physiatrists. Um, we are the ones who are gonna be following uh, these folks long-term. Uh, with regard to the rest of their management strategies for all these other organ systems we just discussed. Um, and we need to recognize how to, yes, optimize function, functional recovery, but also to prevent um, things that can go awry uh, now that we've just had a taste of it as we go through this. So any questions, thoughts, concerns, um, additional things that you all would like to know that I haven't touched upon? Uh, in this lecture, as this will be the foundation. Um, if there are other things that you'd like us to discuss over this semester, I'm still open to adding to my lecture series. Or not. So we, we will continue to move forward. Um, some lectures that I uh, uh, seem to have bumped over uh, last semester, we'll get to this semester, will include uh, wheelchair prescriptions uh, we'll include exercise, we'll include sports uh, for folks with spinal cord injury, and we will talk about some of the uh, most current strategies for um, optimizing motor recovery uh, in the near future. So everyone have a, a wonderful day. Um, have a wonderful, we're still in winter, aren't we? It's so hard for me to imagine this in Miami, but yes, I guess we're in winter. Um, so as we look forward to the spring and what that will bring us, um, we've got an awful lot of learning to do with spinal cord injury. So everyone have a wonderful day. Thank you for your attention. And uh, we will follow through next week where we start talking through the uh, international standards for the classification of spinal cord injury.